All right, ladies and gentlemen, I now want to welcome you to our Wednesday night seminar. This, if you haven't noticed, is the third Wednesday of the month, right? Say hi to Pastor Esteban here. Bienvenidos a nuestra tercer reunión de los miércoles, nuestra noche de seminario. You know... I'm multitasking here a little bit because uh, uh, this is this is you're in the right place if you're here for a Bible seminar. Anyone here for uh, how to read the Bible seminar? Anyone? Todos vienen al seminario de cómo aprender a estudiar la Biblia. They all said so. You're in the right place. You might be thinking to yourself, I don't see a Bible scholar here. A lo mejor están pensando, no veo a ningún maestro de la Biblia aquí enfrente. Or you might be saying, oh, I see three of them. <laughs> <laughs> A lo mejor si hay algunos, pero... <laughs> okay, no, you're not. Uh, we, we have, uh, we're in the world of COVID, right? And, um, and poor Mark has been, um, has, has been, he's been perfectly fine, but, but Dr. Mark Strauss is here with us. He is here, but just not in the room. Because uh, for Dr. Mark, and he may say a few things about it, um, he's given me permission to, to let you know this. He is perfectly fine. He doesn't have any symptoms, but he still tested positive yesterday. So we thought it was a bad idea to have him here sharing with you that way. We're going to have him share in other ways, but not that way. Lamentablemente, la persona que uh, va a comunicar el tema del día de hoy. No lo va a hacer aquí con nosotros, pero vamos a poderlo ver desde su casa porque se hizo un test de COVID y salió positivo el día de ayer. Entonces, no nos podrá acompañar aquí. And so, uh, he's, he's still here, though, and we get to hear a great presentation. Uh, it's just going to be over video. All right. So, it's, this was the last minute decision we made today. <laughs> so, uh, but we're, we really want to keep you safe. You're welcome, Jody. <laughs> Así es de que estamos listos para escuchar. Vamos a escuchar la, la, el seminario completo. Solamente que, pues, por cuestiones que, pues, ya todos sabemos, va, va a ser a través de video. Now, if you are joining us and, uh, and need Spanish language translation, um, that will happen. And uh, Mark should know this, too. That's going to be going on simultaneously. And so we have devices available for you. Obviamente, si necesita traducción al español, vamos a estarlo haciendo a través de aparatos de traducción para que ahí en la parte de afuera puede tomar uno. All right. Well, hey, I want to tell you about a few things as people are coming in and uh, a few quick announcements. And then we're going to get right to Mark. Un par de anuncios y luego vamos a ir a nuestro seminario. Okay, one, on, on Wednesday nights, there's always something, okay? We start every month, Wednesday night, with prayer. And that is, we started the first Wednesday of the month because we believe that's the most important thing we can do together is gather to pray together. And so that's the first Wednesday of every month. Como siempre en estas reuniones de miércoles, queremos recordarle el primer miércoles del mes lo usamos para orar juntos. You're already on the third Wednesday, so I don't need to tell you about that. So welcome to Seminar Night, where we have interesting topics of all sorts every, every month. Y como ya está, saben ustedes, porque están aquí cada tercer miércoles del mes, tenemos enseñanza, entrenamiento. This month and next month are going to be around the Bible. And so if you are someone who loves the Bible like we do here, um, then you're going to want to be at both of these, this month and next month for el sure. El día de hoy y el próximo mes también, el tercer miércoles del mes, vamos a hablar también de la Biblia. And then there's a lot more things coming down the road. Y muchas otras cosas vienen delante. However, on the second and fourth Wednesdays, we have community groups all over campus. Además, los miércoles también tenemos grupos de comunidad aquí en el campus. We have Alpha that just began and there's plenty of space. We'd love to invite if you have friends or yourself who want to learn about the Christian faith, Alpha is the place for you. Si quieres conocer acerca de la fe cristiana, Alpha es un programa, es una comunidad que estamos iniciando aquí en Emmanuel Faith. Puedes ser parte de ello. 
And then our community groups are a great way to get connected in, in the community with other people. Y nuestros grupos de comunidad también es una buena oportunidad para conocer a otras personas. So, we'd love to have you. You're welcome anytime. Así de que son bienvenidos cuando gusten. All right. Well, now without any further ado, we want to get into our content. I hope you came today ready to learn. Because we're going to, we've got a lot of great stuff for you today. Um, can't wait to to introduce our speaker. Vamos a ir a nuestro contenido entonces y vamos a presentar a, a quien va a compartir el día de hoy con nosotros. Recuerde, allá están los aparatitos de traducción. Yo hasta aquí los dejo y los acompaño traduciendo. Okay, and so uh, Pastor Ryan Paulson has the honor of introducing our speaker today. All right, you guys. Um, I, I get to introduce a person that It, to a large degree, needs no introduction, but we'll introduce him anyway. Um, Dr. Mark Strauss is a professor down at Bethel Seminary, and um, more importantly, he was my professor, um, but he also grew up here at Emmanuel Faith. His dad, Doc Strauss, was um, the pastor previous to Dennis, served this church body for uh, so many years really, really well. Um, Dr. Strauss has written a number of books. Uh, my favorite of his books is called Jesus Behaving Badly. I highly recommend it. Um, he also wrote the Bible, which is um, really impressive. Okay, just kidding. He was part of the translating committee for the NIV translation of the Bible. Mark, do you get introduced that way often that you wrote the Bible? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. All right, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark. You're you're on a big screen. You're taller than me on this screen. So uh, we're really grateful to have you here, man. And thank you for uh, for joining us tonight. Will you help me welcome Dr. Mark Strauss? Thank you. It is it is great to be with you. Um, and I I'm so sorry for the, the, the circumstances. I've dodged COVID for so long, um, like many of you, I'm sure and thought I had really escaped it until the latest surge. I was teaching in, in Georgia, actually, teaching a Young Life group in Georgia on the flight home. I got a bit of a cold, a tiny little cold that turned into um, evidently COVID. It's just mild cold symptoms. I'm doing fine. Um, so, um, but, but we thought to be on the safe side, it might be better not for me to come up there or else to stay in Um, social distance as much as possible. But I'm excited about the topic that we're covering today. It's my favorite topic. It's the Bible. Um, and I know you've been hearing um, a good deal, some great messages um, up there um, on the nature of the Bible. And we want to dig a little deeper. As you well know, um, the Bible is under attack. Um, seriously, in our culture, we're un under attack for our support for it as evangelicals and what we believe the Bible to be. And I want to challenge you, maybe shake you up a little bit tonight, um, show you some things maybe you haven't seen, um, and challenge you to, to approach the text maybe from a, a somewhat more sophisticated manner than we sometimes do. And so um, I want to get right into it. You have, I think you have an outline there, and I'll try to point you to different parts of the outline. But we as evangelicals um, believe the Bible to be God's word, um, his inspired message to us, Um, we believe that it is not just reflections, human reflections about God, but it is actually God's self-revelation. And here's sort of the key controlling verse when we talk about that, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed. How much of scripture is inspired by God? How much of scripture is, is God-breathed? Well, the answer there you can see is all of it is God-breathed. And so God, this is God's message to us, useful for correcting, rebuking, teaching, and training in righteousness. If that's the case, if this is God's self-revelation, then God said it, I believe it, and we might say that settles it. And so all we have to do is look in the Bible for the answers to our key questions. And so let's just take a couple of the more controversial questions. Uh, the question like of the role of women and men in the church and the home. What does the Bible teach us about the role of women? Can women serve as pastors? Can they serve as elders? Well, we find the answer in the Bible, right? Um, 
1 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be quiet. Well, there, that's settled. We've got it. The Bible said it. That settles it. That issue is, is settled. That's nice to get that one finally out of the way. One of the most controversial issues in our society today and in the church are same-sex relationships. So all we have to do is turn to the Bible for the answer to same-sex relationships. Leviticus 18.22 says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. So God said it. That settles it. Right? Well, do we obey, in fact, all of the commands of Scripture? Do we obey everything the Bible says? Let's just look at a few other commands and see if this is as simple as it first appears. How about this one? This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs a year old. So we're commanded to offer two lambs on the altar to God every day. Have you offered your lambs today? I would probably not. None of us have offered our lambs today. Or how about this one? Leviticus 19.19. 19. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. So cotton and polyester blend is out. We're not allowed to wear clothing that is made up of more than one kind of material. How many of you obey that command? Or how about this one? Of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But all creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins and scales, you are to detest. In other words, all shellfish, we are commanded not to eat. Lobster, right? We're not we're commanded. Uh, shrimp, we're commanded not, not to eat. Um, so do we obey that command in Scripture? Or how about this one? Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Do we obey that one? I always call that one up when my daughter or my son wants to get a tattoo. I just immediately call that one up and say, see, this is absolutely forbidden in, in Scripture. You, you can't possibly do it, right? So do we obey all the commands in the Bible? It doesn't look like we actually do. Well, here's another question. Should we obey all the commands in the Bible? Are there some commands that we might say we should definitely not obey those commands? How about this one? Proverbs 31.6. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Give beer to anyone who is depressed, in other words. Give wine to anyone who is depressed. That, that doesn't sound like real good therapeutic advice, does it? My wife is a therapist. Some of you know that. I don't think she's ever called up this verse to instruct her, her clients. Or how about this one? Should we obey this one? If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, then all the men of his town shall stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. Well, we certainly have a lot less juvenile delinquency if we, if we follow that one. Should we obey that command? Should we regularly have stonings where we stone children who are rebellious? Or how about this one? This is one of the Ten Commandments. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Now look at the punishment for working on the Sabbath. Whoever does any work on it must be put to death. Well, the Sabbath is the seventh day. That's Saturday. So if you worked on Saturday, you should be executed according to this command. Should we obey that command today? Should we put people, Sabbath breakers, put, put them to death? How about this bizarre one? You may have never seen this one. This is actually a test used for a woman who is suspe suspected of adultery. If feelings of je jealousy come over a husband, he suspects his wife is impure, then he is to take her to the priest who shall take some holy water in a clay jar, put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. When she is made to drink the water, if she is guilty, her abdomen will swell and her womb will miscarry and she will become a curse. Should we practice this thing when, we, when it comes to individuals accused of adultery? Um, obviously, this is problematic. The, the, these are not the kind of commands we would expect to obey. Now, you might say, okay, those are Old Testament commands. They don't apply to Christians, right? We understand that, that the old, we're not under the Old Covenant. As believers, as Christians, we're under the New Covenant. So the question is, do we obey New Testament commands? Um, Here's, here's some examples. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, unfortunately, I can't see you right now, and I didn't see you when you were coming in, but I, I, I would suspect that not a lot of people were kissing each other when you greeted each other today. If you didn't kiss someone next to you, then you are disobeying God's word, even in the new covenant, right? 
Or how about this one, Mark 10, 21, go sell everything you have, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Here's a command to, to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Should we obey that command? How about this one, 1 Timothy 5, 23, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. It is interesting. We're commanded to drink wine. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of wine around. We didn't have alcohol at all in the house. And when I got a position at Bethel, uh, Bethel is from a tradition. My, the seminar I teach it is from a tradition um, of Swedish Baptists who were basically teetotalers. So uh, we were not allowed to drink for the first 15 or so years I was at Bethel. And they eventually changed those rules. But we were not allowed to drink. But then the Bible commanded me to drink. So I was in a quandary. Do I drink or not? Do I obey God's word or do I obey simply the words of man? Um, I won't I won't tell you how I resolved that on, on some occasions, but um, obviously that command is not directly for us. Here's another command in the New Testament. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. It seems to rule out match.com or if you're Christian, christianmingles.com. Are, are we allowed to look for a wife? to seek marriage, in other words. Or how about this one? First Corinthians 11, five. We talked about the role of men and women, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Um, do our women at Emmanuel Faith cover their head when praying or prophesying? Uh, this seems to suggest if they don't cover their head, they are disgracing their head. Or how about this one? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? Now, my hair is getting pretty long. I tried to get a haircut before this time, but with all the COVID mess, I couldn't get it. So apologize for that. It's getting close to dangerous, I think. My hair is a little bit long. The very nature of things teach that if I have long hair, it's a disgrace. What's going on? Should we obey these commands? Sometimes it makes us uncomfortable when we read what Paul says about slaves and masters. Here's Titus 2.9. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. A command to slaves to be subject to their masters. Um, shouldn't Paul say instead, slaves should get free. They should have run away from their masters. Slavery is a horrible institution. So you can see the quandary that we're in here with commands that don't seem to apply. At least most of us would, would argue they don't apply to the church today. So we've been challenged in our culture today as the world around us has become more sophisticated in terms of understanding and hearing about these kinds of commands in scripture. How can we ignore commands related to eating shellfish, for example, but enforce those commands on same-sex relationships? Some would say you're just picking and choosing the ones you like and ignoring the ones you don't like. Is that what we're doing? Are we choosing just what we want? We might be aware of this. The study of how we read and apply God's word is known technically as, technically as hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a Greek word that means to interpret. So how do we understand God's word and then how do we apply its message to our lives today? I want to deal with this in, in really uh, two, starting off with, with two questions. What the Bible is not, first of all, some misconceptions related to the Bible, and then what the Bible is. So let's deal with those Separately, first of all, this is in your outline that you've got. You can see it there. Um, four things the Bible is not, at least not exclusively. The first one is the Bible is not just a list of commands to obey. Not everything in the Bible is meant to be obeyed today. Now, certainly uh, you can open your Bible and read it and see commands all over the place that are great commands for us to obey. Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Here's a command that everyone would definitely affirm and say, absolutely, we are to obey that command. But we've just looked at a number of them that we don't obey, right? Uh, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. None of, we pretty much ignore that one. Greet one another with a kiss of love. We pretty much um, ignore that one as, as well. So some commands we obey, some we don't obey. It's obvious that it's not just a list of commands. It's not just an instruction manual on how to live. Here's the second thing the Bible is not. The Bible is not just a list of promises to claim. When I was in Sunday school, we used to sing a little song. It was, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. 
Is that true? Is every promise in the book, every promise in the Bible mine? I'm going to step on some toes here. Here's a very famous promise that many of us have claimed as a life verse. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and give you a future. That's a great verse, a great promise that God is giving us hope and a future. But do you know who that promise was made to? Because every promise in the Bible has a recipient to whom it's directed. That promise is made to the Jews who are in exile in Babylon. And they're in despair. They're thinking their life with God is over, that they've lost their relationship with God. And God says, no, 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 I have a plan for you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to restore you to the land. But then he turns to those who are still disobedient. A little further on, he says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will send the sword, famine, and plague against them. And I will make them like figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with the sword, famine, and plague, and will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, this is a, this is a promise just like the one before. Um, but I, many people claim this one, Jeremiah 29, 11, as their life verse. I've never heard anyone claim 29, Jeremiah 29, 17 through 19 as their life verse, that God's going to send a, a plague. You see, these are two promises given to different audiences different in different contexts. Can we claim every promise? How do we know which promises to claim and which not to claim? Some promises um, are promises for prosperity. Deuteronomy 28, 11, the Lord will grant you abundant proster- prosperity. But look at Proverbs 6, 11, poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Those are not just promises to claim because they're opposite things. Is God going to give us prosperity or is God going to allow us to fall into into poverty? So you can see the Bible is not just a list of promises to claim. Many promises in the Bible are contingent, for example. Remember when God sent Jonah to Nineveh to to preach the the good news, to, to preach salvation and to warn Nineveh of judgment after that whole great fish incident? Finally, Jonah obeyed the Lord after he ran away from the Lord. He he came back and he obeyed the Lord. And it said, Jonah obeyed the Lord, the word of the Lord, and went to Nineveh, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In other words, God had promised that in in 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed because of her evil. But then what happened? The Ninevites repented. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. They repented, in other words. Look at verse 10. When God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. He said he was going to judge them. He did it and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So he made a a statement, a promise of what was going to happen, but it was contingent, dependent on their response. Here's another example of this. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah in Isaiah 38 is told he's going to die. God says, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. There's a promise. There's a statement of what's going to happen, a prophecy. You're going to die. Hezekiah prayed and prayed and said, God, give me some more years. I'll I'll serve you faithfully these, these years. Look at what happened. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I have heard your prayers and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. So God changed his mind, at least from our perspective, he changed his mind when Hezekiah prayed. This prophecy or this promise um, was contingent. And and when Hezekiah prayed, God responded. So that's our second point. Our second thing in the Bible is not, is it's not just a list of promises that we can claim. Each of those promises has a context. Here's a third thing the Bible is not, and this is perhaps the most controversial thing I'll say, to, one of the most controversial things I'll say tonight, because I think sometimes we do read the Bible in this way, and that is that the Bible is not a magic answer book. It's not a magic answer book. Sometimes we're looking for an answer to, to life's questions. Uh, maybe who should I marry? or whether I should pursue a particular career, or where I should go to school. And we sometimes turn to the Bible and we say, God, give me an answer. And we flip through the text trying to find the answer that we're looking for. Uh, That's not the way, I would argue, that's not the way the Bible works. Let me give you a couple of examples of magic answer book. One of them that's that's very personal to me. Uh, One of these occurs in um, um, Blackaby's book, Experiencing God. I mention that because this is a great book, a great book that basically says, 
God has a purpose and plan in the world, and we're to get on board with that purpose and plan. And in one chapter of that book, it gives a number of examples of determining, discovering God's word by reading the Bible. In one, in one of these stories, um, a woman named Gail, her husband is a dentist, and they, they live in Texas. And he visits the church in, in New York, and the, the, the church calls him to be their pastor. And he's thinking of leaving the dentist, his dentist career and moving to New York. The wife, whose name is Gail, doesn't feel like they should do that doesn't feel like they should move. But then she begins reading the Bible in her normal devotions. And she comes to this verse. She comes to Luke 4.43, where it says, Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. She sees that phrase, to the other towns also, and she hears that as a word from God to her and, and to her husband, that they should move to a new town and start a new ministry. So basically, she understood God to be speaking through his word to her. Now, is that a legitimate way to read scripture? Um, and um, here's another example, or, or what if, I'm sorry, what if she had read this instead, instead of um, Luke chapter four, what if she had read Isaiah 33, 20? Look upon Zion, a tent that will not be moved. If she'd come across the phrase, will not be moved, would she have said, oh, we're not going to move. We're supposed to stay where we are. Is that a legitimate way to speak, read scripture? Another way to say this is, does God speak through random verses taken out of context? Does God speak through random verses taken out of context? Now, when we read it that way, you might say, absolutely not. But how many of us have experienced God speak to us through a phrase or through a, a verse that doesn't really mean that in context? Luke 4 doesn't mean you're supposed to get up and move to another town. It means that Jesus was proclaiming the gospel throughout the town's of Galilee, and that God had called him to do that. Here's another example of this. Suppose you're deciding which college to attend, and you've got scholarships to two prestigious colleges, one on the West Coast. Let's say you've got a, a scholarship to Stanford on the West Coast, and you've got a scholarship to Princeton on the East Coast. Which should you go to? You're reading your Bible, looking for an answer. You come across Isaiah 24, 14. They raise their voices. They shout for joy. From the West, they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Well, it's settled. You go to Stanford. But then you read one more verse, and it says, Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the islands of the sea. Well, which is it? See, you see what this is doing? This is randomly choosing phrases or coming across phrases. Does God speak to us through random verses taken out of context? Now, this is a challenging one because I think many of us could certainly say God has spoken to us. We believe God has spoken to us in this way in time, um, at, at some time in our life. Um, our family has a very strong and, and significant story. Um, my father, who Ryan was just mentioning, who pastored Emmanuel Faith for 21 years. He was a pastor in Alabama and got a call to come to Emmanuel Faith. And we, we definitely believe God was, God was speaking to him to move to California. At one point, he was just agonizing over the decision. My mom didn't think we should do it. We were very happy. He was very happy in the church in, in Alabama. Um, and then he went away on kind of a spiritual retreat. He got alone in a cabin and just prayed and fasted and read the Bible. And he came across this verse. He came across Isaiah 43, 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This is from the King James Version, because that's exactly what he was, he was reading at the time, the King James Version. I will make rivers in the desert. He said, first of all, God's going to do a new thing. Well, that must be a new ministry. Secondly, Southern California is in a desert region. So he understood that God was speaking to him through that, through this verse. Now, that's part of our family lore. Um, now, I have no doubt that God was directing my father to move to California, but is, is this the way we should discover God's will? By taking verses that are randomly out of context. This passage in Isaiah is not about moving from Alabama to California. It's about God's new creation, the restoration of all things, the, the new creation that he accomplishes through the life, death, and resurrection of, of Jesus. So do we sometimes read the Bible that way? So there's three things the Bible is not, a list of commands to obey, a list of promises to claim, a magic answer book that gives us the answer to questions. Here's a fourth one, and that is a handbook on Christian ethics. 
a handbook on Christian ethics. So what do I mean by this? Does the Bible give an absolute ethic that is the final word on every topic? Sometimes we think that the Bible gives us the last word, the final word. But take some examples. Look at slavery, for example, or marriage. Let me just give you a couple of statements in Scripture. Is this the final word on slavery? Leviticus 25, 44 says, Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. This is a command to Israel saying they could buy slaves. Is that the final ethic on slavery? Should we say, oh, it's okay to buy slaves? Or look at Titus 2, 9, where Paul says, Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. Paul is writing at a time when slavery was, pro, was everywhere in the Roman Empire. It was a foundation to the Roman Empire. To oppose slavery would mean immediate arrest and execution. So Paul doesn't give an absolute ethic. He doesn't say what, what we would like him to say. He doesn't say, slaves, you need to get free. Masters, Christian masters, you need to let all your slaves free. He doesn't say that. Is the Bible, does it give a final ethic on these things? Or how about marriage? Deuteronomy 21, 15 says this, if a man has two wives, now just stop right there. If a man has two wives, shouldn't that say a man should not have two wives? That polygamy is wrong, that God's design for marriage is one man and one woman? Well, polygamy was a part of society. And so the commands are, are sometimes culturally specific to adjust to specific situations, to address specific situations. They're not always the absolute ethic, the final word on these issues. So we have to recognize that, that the Bible is written in a particular culture and context, not always the final ethic. The Bible doesn't address many, many issues, contemporary issues today. We wish it would in many ways. The Bible doesn't directly address abortion or euthanasia or drug abuse or gambling or child abuse or spousal abuse. Stem cell research, war and pacifism, genetic engineering, birth control, pornography, premarital sex. These are all current contemporary issues of enormous significance in our society today. The Bible doesn't address them. It's, it's written in a different culture, a different context. Now you could say there are principles. Absolutely there are principles. From scripture. We'll talk about that as we go along. But the Bible doesn't give specifics on a number of ethical issues. All right, I hope you're not too troubled at this point. We're going to rebuild some of the things we've broken down a little bit. But four things the Bible is not, not just commands to obey. We don't just look for what we should do necessarily from the biblical text, not promises to claim. Every promise has a context, a specific recipient. It's potentially contingent. Um, it's not a magic answer book. We can just uh, look for an answer and God gives it to us. It's not a handbook on Christian ethics. So what is the Bible? Let's look at um, four things the Bible is right here. First of all, the Bible is God's word. The Bible is God's word. I said four things. I'm gonna we're gonna look at, at three main things that the Bible is here. His message to humanity. We said that before. Absolutely true. Second uh, Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We believe, again, this is not just human reflections about God. This is, in fact, God's revealed word, his message to us. That's the divine side of, of the Bible. But the real question is, how does God speak to us through his word? And that brings up the second thing the Bible is. It's not only divine, a divine message, a message from God. It's also a human message. It's delivered through human agents in diverse circumstances. So we have not only the unity of Scripture, the fact that it is God's self-revelation, but we also have diversity in Scripture. It's given by human agents in different contexts, two different people. The biblical documents were written in a historical, cultural, and social, and political world far removed from our own. To understand the biblical documents, we have to try to enter that world. We sometimes talk about the hermeneutical bridge. What do we mean by that? Well, here, here just illustrates it. Um, this is us on the right. That's our culture, our context, reading God's word in our situation. The them is the world of the biblical writers. And between us and them, there's a chasm of time, of space, of culture, of language. In order to apply God's word to our lives, we have to first travel back. We have to enter into the world and see what's going on in that context. 
Why would God make this command in this particular context? Would, why would God allow slavery in this particular context? We've got to enter into that world to understand that situation. Then we've got to take that message and bring it into our world. How do we apply it in this world? There are technical terms for the, these two things. Going back into the world of the text, we call exegesis. Exegesis means determining the author's intended meaning. And then contextualization is, or recontextualization is bringing a message to today. How do we take the command given to them in their culture and their context and apply it appropriately today? Scripture is diverse, written by various authors, probably 40 or so authors, written in various languages, Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New, written at different times and in different places, from palaces to prisons, with different purposes and occasions. The Bible is not a book. It is a library written with many diverse literary forms, psalms, parables, history, letters, prophecy. We've got to recognize each of those literary forms if we're going to understand the message of the Bible. Let me illustrate this diversity by looking at a few of these, these literary genres or these literary forms, ones we're maybe not so familiar with. Revelation 13.1. If you've never read the book of Revelation and came across this, you'd go, what in the world? The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. It sounds like a fantasy novel, maybe in our cultural context. But what is the genre? The genre is apocalyptic. Now to understand the symbols, it's very symbolic. To understand these symbols, we have to enter into the world of the text. Um, what function did apocalyptic literature have in Judaism in the first century? What do symbols mean? Where do these symbols come from? We know they come from the Old Testament mostly. Apocalyptic literature is a specific kind of Jewish literature. To understand it, we have to enter into the world of the text. How about this genre? You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The hills are going to burst into song. That sounds like a Disney movie or something. Like that, right? Little mouths come on the, the, the hills and the mountains and they start singing. The trees start clapping their hands and, and singing. What's the genre? Well, obviously, this is poetry. This is poetry. It's embedded in prophetic oracles. To understand it, we have to understand how does poetry function. This is figurative language. It's not literal language. We have to enter into the world of the text. We can't just say, God said it, I apply it. We have to say, what is the context? What is the culture? What is the background to this passage? Here's another literary genre. Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Do not answer a fool. That's good advice. Don't answer a fool, or you'll be like him yourself. But then if you look at the very next verse, the very next proverb, it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Look at this. These are two verses that contradict each other. Actually, they don't contradict each other. They're two Proverbs. Notice they're right beside each other. They can't possibly contradict if the author put them beside each other. But what are they? They are Proverbs. And Proverbs are general truths, not universal truths, general truths that apply to specific situations. Is there a time to answer a fool? I would say absolutely. If someone next to you makes a racist remark or says something really inappropriate, you need to challenge that person. You need to, to challenge them. You need to answer them. On the other hand, we've all been in situations where we get in an argument, a silly argument with someone. It just goes back and forth. We answer a fool according to his folly, um, and we become just like the fool himself. There are times to answer fools. There's times not to answer fools. That's the nature of Proverbs. We've got to understand the genre if we're going to understand the text. Here's one of my favorites. This is from Ecclesiastes. A feast, I came across this the, a while back and I just had to put it in this, this slide presentation. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. I think some Christians believe that today. Money is the answer for everything. Well, wh where is that found? It's found in Ecclesiastes. This is not God's wisdom. This is human wisdom. This is folly. This is trying to, to live life apart from God. Solomon's folly, you might call it, in Ecclesiastes. So you see, we've got to find out what the genre is, what the literary form is, what the author was doing here. Even when we turn to a genre like letters, right? Uh, the, the letters of Paul are maybe the ones we read the most and preach and teach from the most because they seem so directly applicable. 
And they are in many cases. First Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, we would all say we can directly apply that command to our lives. And for the most, part, most of these commands, we can directly apply. But we've got to remember, this is a letter written to the Corinthian church in the first century, addressing their concerns in their specific cultural context and historical context. So we shouldn't be surprised when we get down to chapter 11 and it says, every woman who has her head uncovered while praying disgraces her head. And suddenly we, we just took the other one directly into our lives. We applied it directly. But now we say, do we apply it directly? We have to recognize both of these commands are given in letters written to a particular culture and context and specific church. We have to put them through the, the, the same filter to understand whether we and how we apply them to our lives today. Here's the dilemma. And I, I take this, this phrase from um, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart, their book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And, and we'll illustrate it with, of course, a penis cartoon right here. The Bible is not written to you. The Bible is not written to you. Now, that's jarring to many people, many Christians. The Bible is not written to you. Well, of course it's written to you. Well, no, who was it written to? Look at this penis cartoon. Charlie Brown says to Linus, where have you been? Linus says, church school. Uh, we've been studying the letters of the Apostle Paul. Charlie Brown says, that should be interesting. And, and Linus says, oh, it is. Although I must admit, it makes me feel a little guilty. I always feel like I'm reading someone else's mail. Linus says, when I read Paul's letters, I feel like I'm reading someone else's mail. Well, that's exactly what he's doing. He's reading someone else's mail. We just read the letter to the Corinthians. If We've got to keep that in mind, that the Bible is not written to you. Now, all we have to do is change that preposition to, to apply what the Bible is. The Bible may not, maybe not was not written to you, but the Bible is written for you. It is God's revelation given in different cultures, in different contexts, to different people, but has application for you. So the question becomes, how do we apply it? How do we apply God's truth to our lives? Here's the third thing the Bible is, and then we'll talk more about that question. Um, to understand what the Bible is, and I, you talk about this a lot in Emmanuel Faith, I know when you talk through, when you study individual passages, the Bible is a story. It's an overall story, the story of God's dealings with human beings. We call this the meta narrative, the great overall drama that controls all of life. We could summarize that drama this way. God was the sovereign creator of all things. He created this universe, created this heaven and this earth as a perfect place for human beings to live in, to serve him, to honor him. But human beings rejected God's authority. They rebelled against him. And so they were judged for that rebellion and, and all of creation became a fallen place, <laughs> a fallen place, excuse me. And the whole rest of the story, the whole rest of the drama is God bringing his people back into right relationship with him. Redemption or restoration. Uh, Ryan was just talking about this the other day in, in, in his sermon, that the, the story of the Bible is the story of redemption. Remember Jesus on that road to Emmaus, who says he, he beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he described what was written about himself in all of scripture. That's the drama. That's the story from beginning to end. Um, that, that God's plan of redemption finds its climax, finds its culmination in the coming of, of Jesus. So it's so crucial to understand that's what we have. We don't have a bunch, of, just a bunch of commands to obey. We have a story of God's dealing with humanity. And the story is crucial things. First of all, most importantly, it teaches us who God is, who God is. It teaches us then who we are in relationship to him, created in his image to serve him, honor him. Even in our rebellion, we still retain the image of God. The Bible, the story teaches us what God's purposes for the world are, why he created this, this world and what his purposes are. In order to then understand the story, we have to immerse ourselves in it. Read the story from beginning to end and learn God's values and purposes. It's not just about pulling a command here, a promise there. It's about learning who God is, what he values, what his goals and purposes are. And then we as human beings need to make decisions in line with his character values and purpose. It's more than just taking a command out of context and trying to apply it. It's about learning to think God's thoughts after him, learning his character, his values, his purposes. I call this in my book that we were referring to that much of this material comes from the book, How to Read the Bible in Changing Times, by the way. 
Um, and in this book, I call this a heart of God hermeneutic, a heart of God. What are we seeking when we read scripture? We're seeking to discern God's heart. What are God? What is God's character? What are God's values? What are God's purposes for us? When we determine that, we can, we can learn to apply God's truth to everyday situation in life. I want to move on to the next point here. We've looked at what the Bible is not, what the Bible is. Let's go on then to four key questions to ask of any text. Four key questions. Whenever you come to a text of scripture, here are four key questions to ask, all right? Here's the first question. Where is this passage in the greater story of scripture? Remember, it's a story from beginning to end. And where you are in that story tells us a great deal about the nature of that command. For example, Leviticus 19.19. 19. We talked about this passage. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Should we obey that command? Well, who was that command given to? It's in Leviticus. It's in the Old Covenant. It was given to Israel. It was not given to the church. It's nothing like this is, is given to the church. This was given to Israel. So we recognize it's part of Israel's civil commands, part of Israel's covenant with God. The Israelites were to obey this. They were not to wear clothing made of two kinds of material or to plant two kinds of seed in, in their fields. They were not to do that. That was part of God's command. It's not a command given to us. So identifying where we are in scripture is crucial for understanding whether that command is for us or not. How about this command that we looked at, at the beginning? This is what you're to offer on the altar regularly, two lambs a year old. Once again, that's from Exodus. That's from the, the law given to Israel. It was never given to the church. In fact, we learn in the church, this law has been fulfilled or completed in Christ. The whole letter to the Hebrews talks about this, how Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial system, how we no longer offer sacrifices. Why? Because Christ is the ultimate and final sacrifice. He is the true sacrifice. These animal sacrifices were just pointing. They were symbolically pointing forward to him. Hebrews 9, 11, But when Christ came as high priest, he did not enter, that is, enter the tabernacle by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption. So that command was given to Israel to be fulfilled in the church. Here's the second key question that you need to ask of every passage. The question is, what is the author's purpose in its original context? Now, this is really important, okay? Uh, the, the, first, the first question, what, where is the passage in the greater story? The second, what is the author's purpose? Because the purpose of the command is actually more important than the command itself. Because that purpose teaches us about the nature of the one who gives the command and the values that are driving that command. Let me illustrate this from, from my own life. Suppose I say to my son, I give him $10 and I say, hey, what I, would, you, would you wash the car? We're going to take the car on a trip. I want, let, let's get it washed. Would you run it down to the automatic car wash and just drive it through the automatic car wash and wash the car? My son says, you bet, I'll do that. So I gave him a command. He went, he comes back. Two hours later, and he, he gives me my $10 back. And he says, I washed the car myself. And I also detailed it. I vacuumed it and detailed the whole car. It's, and it's beautiful. Okay, now, did he fulfill my command? Did he obey my command? Well, no, he didn't. What did I tell him to do? I, I told him to take that car through the car wash. But actually, he fulfilled the purpose of my command. In fact, he exceeded the purpose of my command by washing it himself and also by detailing it. You see, you can fulfill the purpose of the command and actually obey the command without actually obeying the specifics of the command, those, those points that were, were not essential or fundamental. Determining the purpose of the command helps us to determine how to apply it in other contexts, in other cultures. So let me just illustrate this. What's the original purpose of some of these commands we looked at earlier? Greet one another with a kiss of love. Does Paul just want a lot of kissing going on? Does he want to make sure that everybody kisses a lot in the church? No, what is this? Well, in the ancient Near East, as in the Middle East today, um, kissing is the way that people greeted each other, especially family members greeted each other. So this was a way for believers to recognize and to show, to demonstrate they were a family, that, that the gospel creates new relationships that supersede even physical family relationships. So that's the purpose of that command. How about 1 Timothy 5? No longer drink water, but use a little wine. Well, in context, what's the purpose of that command? Is that command to make sure that everybody drinks alcohol? Of course it's not. Um, wine in this case is being used medicinally. This is for Timothy, who, who clearly has frequent problems with his stomach, and wine could soothe that. 
And Timothy had a tendency to be ascetic, to be basically self-denying in, in order to discipline himself to serve God better. And Paul says, Timothy, you've got to relax. Go ahead, take some medicine. It's okay to take some medicine. You don't have to always be so, put your body through, through such rigors all the time. You can take medicine, uh, you can relax and do that. It's good for you. So this, this has a purpose in its original context. Uh, not a command to drink alcohol per se, but a command that taking medicines is okay. We don't have to live a life of, of strict discipline, absolute strict discipline. Now here's a negative example of this where we don't know the purpose of the command. We puzzle, many scholars puzzle over 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which tells women to cover their head in worship. And the whole context is diff difficult, that we don't know for sure what was going on in Judaism, what was going on in, in the secular world, the pagan world at this time. We don't really understand the purpose of the head coverings. So my point in this one is if we can't determine the purpose, the reason behind it, we need to be very cautious in applying it today. To insist on the application of this today um, is not a good thing because we don't really understand the, 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 per the command in its original context. Proper application begins with sound exegesis, determining the author's intention. Sound exegesis, remember what that means? Crossing the bridge back to the world of the text to understand what the, what the command meant in its cultural and specific context. And it illustrates this point. Here's a Bible study going on. You may have been in a Bible study sometime that was something like this. The pastor is leading the study. He says, Paul says in verse 14, that because of his chain, this is Philippians 1, you're studying, others have been encouraged. What do you think he means? Because of his chains, others have been encouraged. As I raise the hand, oh, I know, Paul's writing a letter, right? So this is a chain letter, like the one I just got. This woman responds, no, no, you're missing the point. I'm a chain smoker, and God is speaking to us to me through this to tell me I am to encourage other chain smokers. Um, this guy says, well, it reminds me of that Aretha Franklin song, Chain of Fools. Maybe Paul means we're fools for Christ. Pastor says, um, those are very interesting insights, but do you think Paul could simply be referring to his prison chains in Rome? The response to that is the woman says, I told you this Bible study wasn't about practical living. And the man says, R-E-S-P-E-C-T is another Aretha song that ministers to me. I want to ask for a show of hands. If you've ever been in a Bible study, it's done something like this, where, where the question is raised, what does this mean? And people respond, this is what it means to me, immediately applying the text to our own situation without first doing what? Without first entering the world of the text, without crossing that hermeneutical bridge back, understanding what the purpose of the command was in its original context before trying to apply it to our cultural context today. So here's a third question. What do we learn here about the nature and purpose of God? Every passage, no matter what genre, teaches us about God's nature and purpose. And so no matter what the, the context, no matter what the genre, we're going to learn something about who God is and what his purpose in the world is. Let me just illustrate this um, again. From, from some of the passages we looked at. What do we learn about God's nature and purpose from this command? This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly, two lambs a year old. Now, this is a shocking command, if you really think about it, that, that animals were to be killed for, for these sacrifices. I was once preaching, um, it was actually Emmanuel Faith, years and years ago, I was preaching Emmanuel Faith, and um, afterwards, two teenage girls came up to me, and one of them said, I cannot believe in a God um, who would command that innocent animals simply be slaughtered. So I can't believe in a God. That seems so cruel to me. Now, my first um, inclination was to say, oh, it wasn't so bad. They killed him real quick, you know, and, and they, they barely felt anything. Um, and I, I was about to say that, and I, stopped and I said, no. And I, I thought, and I said, you know, you're absolutely right. That's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. To animal death, death of any kind is a horrible thing. It's not what we were meant to be. It's not what we were created to be. But why, why did God command animal death? What does that tell us about the nature and purpose and character of God? It means he's a God who demands justice, who will right every wrong. He is a God who's not only all loving, but is all just. And so sin has to be paid for. There has to be justice. If God was not a God of justice, then evil would, would run rampant throughout the world. Forever it would run rampant. There would be no judgment for the, for the evil acts 
of evil people, but God is a God of justice as well as grace and love. So a command like this reminds us God is a God of justice. What about this strange command again? Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Well, what does this tell, tell us about the nature of God? It's probably symbolic. Um, it's pointing to God's purity, that God is absolutely pure. So he commands Israel not to mix unlike things as a symbol of God's purity. So God's justice, God's purity. How about this command? Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Again, that's not a command given to us directly. It was given to that rich young ruler. But what does it tell us about the nature of God? When he would say, sell everything you have. It tells us that everything we own, everything we have belongs to God. Your, your family, your wife or husband belong to God, not to you. Your children belong to God. He's given them to you on loan. That house you own belongs to God. So really, if he were to command you to sell everything, it should be no big deal because it already belongs to him. Are you using these things for his glory? You see, so every command in Scripture, whether it applies directly to us or not, tells us something about God's nature, God's purpose. How about this one? Strange one. First Corinthians 7, are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. Well, in this context, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the priority of God in our lives. That God is more important than those human relationships that will never find ultimate satisfaction in human relationships apart from God. And so essentially he goes on to say that those who are married in this particular context, those who are married can be distracted from their, their serving the Lord, their love for the Lord. He says, and that takes priority. So God must take priority in our lives. Command it not doesn't mean nobody should ever look for a wife, but it does tell us a principle, a truth about the nature and purpose of God. Okay, here's the final of those four questions. Based on the, the four questions, based on the question, what is the path? Where is the passage in the greater story of Scripture? What is the off purpose? What do we learn about the nature and purpose of God? Finally, who ought we to be? And what ought we to do as those who seek to reflect the character and purpose of God? Once we reach this point, we can say, okay, understanding the heart of God, how ought we to live in light of that truth of who God is and his purpose for the world? Okay, I want to take about five or so, maybe 10 more minutes and, and do one more thing here before we open this up to questions. Um, and that is, in addition to these four questions, I want to give you a couple of criteria for some of these challenging cultural issues. How do we know what to obey directly and what to obey at the level of principle? And I've given you actually eight, eight criteria. You can see those in the outline, eight criteria. But the first three really tend to give us the answer to our questions we raise. So the first three, I think, have priority. And then if you can't come to a conclusion based on the first three, the others, you can turn to the others and wrestle with them through there. So these are some key criteria for cultural analysis, for determining whether a command in scripture should be directly applied in our life or needs to be applied more broadly at the level of principle. And we've already talked about this first, the criteria of purpose. The purpose or rationale behind a command determines its application. So when we come to a passage like the, the holy kiss, for example, or, or, or head covering, um, we, we need to say, what's the purpose of this? The holy kiss, we said the purpose of this is to greet brothers and sisters in Christ as brothers and sisters. That family relationship is fundamental because the, the gospel creates new relationships. With the criterion of purpose, we said we didn't really understand the purpose. At least I don't understand the purpose of the head covering. And so we dare not apply that directly and command that in, this, in situations today. Here's a second uh, criteria that's uh, absolutely essential to me. And that is the criterion of correspondence or of cultural correspondence. The closer the cultural or historical context to our own, the more likely we can apply the command directly the closer to our culture and context. So we ask, is this the same in the first century or in the Old Testament period as it was today? So this command, for example, Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. We can ask the question, is, is drinking alcohol, is what the way alcohol affects our lives pretty much the same today as it was in the first century? Of course, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. The alcohol can do the same damage to society, can do the same damage to, to physical bodies, can do the, do the same damage to relationships and the family. It can contribute to abuse, it can contribute to poverty. Of all of those things, 
pretty much the same. So that command would almost certainly apply directly to our lives. Don't get drunk with wine. But here's one that probably doesn't apply directly, at least the second half. I want women to dress modestly. Well, that's true. That's a command that certainly applies. Men and women should both dress modestly. But then it gives a civic cultural application, not with braided hair or gold or pearls. But that doesn't mean that women should never have braided hair, should never have gold or, or pearls or expensive clothes. What's it saying is whatever is modest, considered modest in that cultural context, is referring to Greco Roman women who would have these enormous um, hair pieces, these enormous coiffers, uh, and they would put all their jewels and pearls in them just to show off their wealth, to demonstrate their wealth and prestige and power. And, and Paul says, don't do that. Don't show off your wealth in that way. So it corresponds in terms of principle, but not directly in terms of um, the specifics of it. Um, here's a, another example of that, a foot washing. Um, Jesus, of course, washes the disciples' feet in, in John chapter 13. Um, some churches practice foot washing today. Is this a command? Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Is that a command for today? Should we wash each other's feet? Did Jesus command it? Well, he commanded his disciples. But foot washing is a very different thing today than it was in the first century. Of course, people walked uh, with sandals on dusty roads. And when they'd arrive for a, a banquet or a dinner party, a slave would wash their feet. Only a slave would do something so menial. So what, what is Jesus saying? He's not saying physically you have to wash each other's feet. The principle here um, is that we need to serve each other, even in the most menial manners. We, we are to serve and lift each other up to, to honor one another. So um, different cultural context, um, difference in correspondence. Um, do not cut your bodies for the dead um, or put tattoo marks on yourselves. Does this forbid all tattoos? Well, tattoos in, the, in this ancient Near Eastern context were almost certainly signs of idolatry. You would put the tattoo of a pagan god. And so what is God saying in that cultural context? He's saying, don't worship other gods. Very different today. I have um, students come to me and they want to put you know, a Hebrew name, Yahweh, or, the, or, or love or grace on their arm. Is that wrong? Well, it's a very different situation, obviously, today, because that it doesn't correspond culturally. And finally, a third criteria that's key is criterion of canonical consistency. Ethical commands or imperatives that remain consistent throughout the Bible likely reflect God's universal will. Things that remain consistent all the way through, um, we, we can almost certainly apply directly to our lives today. Let me give you some examples, um, commands that are consistent. The command against adultery throughout scripture, always wrong. Adultery is always wrong. Murder is always wrong. Uh, stealing is always wrong. The exploitation of the poor, always wrong. There's absolute consistency. So we can say, absolutely, those are commands for today. But what about other things? Eating shellfish. Well, no, in the old covenant, it's forbidden, but in the new covenant, it's not. Drinking alcohol. In some contexts, alcohol is, is dangerous, certainly. But the moderate use is not is not commanded against in every situation. Eating food sacrificed to idols. Paul deals with this one in First Corinthians. Um, he, he says sometimes it's okay, depending on the context. You know that the idols are nothing; they're not real gods anyway, so it doesn't matter. But in some contexts, it's absolutely wrong. Um, we can apply this to one of the most controversial issues of the last generation, a woman's role in the church and the home. The Bible is not, I would argue, the Bible gives mixed signals in terms of the role of, of women. It suggests that at least part of this is, is these commands are based on cultural context. We looked at 1 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, but we didn't look at Galatians 3, 28, where it says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So Paul says there is, the gospel breaks down these ethnic distinctions between Jews and Gentiles, breaks down these uh, social distinctions between slave and free and between male and female. Obviously, the gospel breaks down barriers that, that were in place in the old covenant. That would suggest that women's position is different in the new covenant than in the old covenant. And then we see examples um, in the New Testament of gifted female leaders who seem to be leading. Women like uh, the Old and the New Testament, Deborah, for example, Miriam, um, Huldah, the prophetess, Priscilla, the gifted teacher, Junia, seems to be identified as one of the apostles. He is called a deacon, a deaconess, uh, a leadership position in the church. 
So we see examples of female leaders. On the other hand, we do see male leadership. Uh, the priesthood in Israel is entirely male. The 12 apostles were male. Uh, uh, elders in the church appear to be mostly, if not exclusively, males. So we've got mixed evidence. In the, when the context is, or when the canon, when the Bible is not consistent, then we, then we should take another look um, and, and wonder whether some of these commands, aspects of them are cultural, not meant for the church of all time. Now, obviously, I'm not answering that question. That's a huge question. We've actually talked about it before in other contexts. But I, I, I want, want you to see these principles that help us to wrestle with these things and to hear God speak and hear God's, God's word in our cultural context so that we can obey it and obey it consistently. Uh, not, not just pick and choose what we want to obey, but rather to have sound principles for determining God's purpose and will for us in the world today. All right, we've covered a ton of material. I know we've flown through it. I'll, I'll let you look at those other principles. And it looks to me like we've got about uh, 22 minutes or so potential for, for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Josh, I think, um, and uh, take his lead as to how we want to go, go further now. Uh, Dr. Strauss? We are. Uh, we're saying thank you. In fact, Dr. Strauss, uh, you just need to see the audience real quick. So, hey there, how are you doing? And so they are, uh, I, I hate doing these things when I can't see the audience. And so they're here. <laughs> um, this is a great crowd that is uh, enjoying a great presentation. We were able to hear you just fine. Thank you so much. We've got, and we do have 20 minutes and we have a, some really, really good questions. So Dr. Strauss, we're going to jump in because Josh and I have to answer the ones that you don't get to. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so there's definitely some I want you to answer. Here's the first one. Um, some guy named Ryan is wondering if you would be willing to come preach 1 Corinthians 11 <laughs> because it's one of the more difficult texts <laughs> in the New Testament, in my opinion. So, yeah. um, are you willing to do that, Mark? Absolutely not. We can talk later. <laughs> yeah. Wise. That's he wise. He said no. He said yeah. no, right? That's wise. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. wise. <laughs> what am I, what am I mentoring? Anyway. Gordon, All right. Gordon, Gordon Fee. You, you, I'm, I know Ryan and Josh. And Gordon Fee, one of the great, great New Testament teachers. And I wrote a book on Bible translation with him. He wrote sort of the definitive commentary on 1 Corinthians. And if you read 1 Corinthians 11, he kind of gets to the end of the passage and he says, I really don't know. And when a scholar that great says, I don't know, I think we have, to, I think in many ways that passage is left in scripture to keep us humble because it is so difficult and so challenging. Amen. Amen. I'll ask you off the record what you think of Pepiat's work on it and uh, mm. her, some of her conclusions. So, yeah. all right. Uh, let's jump in. Let's jump right in, Ryan. Okay, so um, we have, because we have real questions, and people have been upvoting these questions. You've been doing that. Um, uh, I can put it back up there if you'd like to. So we've got a few that might take a while, right? Yeah. Do you want to start with? Yeah, the okay. Top? So here's the most popular question, Mark. It's Will you revisit the purpose of women not being allowed to teach over a man? And then a question that is in line with that Can a woman? be a pastor yeah yeah i i think don't you dare freeze on the screen either <laughs> yeah that's right that's Oops, not allowed I'm sorry. During this the sounds going out sounds going out yeah <laughs> i think one thing we have to first of all acknowledge is there is a lot going on culturally there's no doubt about that we cannot deny that and we cannot deny that the first century world was a patriarchal culture you know, at this time in the Roman Empire, there was a, a new woman's movement that was something like we might call a feminist movement that the, the Roman leaders, Caesar himself and others, viewed as a threat. Um, we know that Paul is constantly trying to keep, to keep Christians as obedient Roman subjects so that they, to, to avoid persecution, to, to, to demonstrate that they are good subjects. So it, it would make sense that Paul would agree, that would encourage Christians to follow the patriarchal parts of their culture in order to be good citizens. So there's no doubt in my mind that there is a lot going on there. That, you know, the, the more difficult question is, um, you know, is there any distinction between the roles of men and women? There's no doubt in my mind that Christianity exalted women in terms of its honoring them in terms of their role 
Uh, Jesus had women disciples. We know that not part of the 12. Certainly the 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel. So they were naturally male, but he had disciples. Uh, Mary Magdalene was clearly a disciple. Mary and Martha were disciples. Mary, uh, the, the sister of Martha, sat at the feet of Jesus, a position of discipleship. Um, in the early church, we do see women, I would argue, in leadership roles. Priscilla seems to be taking that role. Junia does. In the Old Testament, I don't think we can deny uh, that Deborah was a leader um, and taking a position of, of leadership. So I, I would hold the view that there are exceptions, certainly, even if we say, okay, in general, God, God has called men to leadership roles and women to more supportive roles. There are certainly exceptions in scripture. I think we have to acknowledge that and therefore we have to allow exceptions. When God has called a woman, we have to respect that. It seems to me we have to respect that call. In terms of pastor, to me, this is a bit of a puzzle because the word pastor means shepherd. Um, and the Greek word means shepherd. It's the same word as shepherd. And, and women were shepherds um, in, in the Old Testament as well as the New. Rachel was a shepherd. So I don't see any problem with calling women pastors. Um, they're they're um, they're leading in that way. They are shepherding the flock and so forth. Um, elders um, were almost certainly in the New Testament exclusively men, but that would have reflected the Jewish model again. So um, I, I don't personally, personally, I don't see any problem with women serving beside men in senior leadership roles. I think primarily what Paul is a, is is calling the the men in the church to is to step up to be leaders because men in these context have a tendency to abrogate. Um, in religious context, men to step back, not to take leadership roles, to let the women lead in these areas. Paul knows that that's going to be disastrous for the church if men do not take responsibility for their actions. So I think Paul is primarily talking about male responsibility rather than male dominance. Um, I think the other point I would make is that I think the real problem with this issue in the church is that we have our model of leadership wrong. Um, what is leadership? Well, in, in our cultural context, leadership is about power. It's about influence. It's about authority. It's about me trying to get others to do what I want them to do. But that's not biblical leadership. That's not Christian leadership. Jesus says, if you want to be great, you have to be a, a servant. You have to be a slave. A slave exists for the good of others. Um, a Christian leader is meant to be one who empowers others, who enables others to be all that God has called them to be. We've seen in recent years, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of leaders fail, and it's always the same thing. It's always about power, authority, and they get to the point where people are no longer holding them accountable. Um, and so I would, just, I would just say that we need to change the model of what leadership is. Leadership is about exalting others, empowering them to be all that God has called them to be. When we, get, when we can reach that leadership, I think we're going to find – um, that this issue goes away uh, because leaders should be those who lift others up. It's a great word. Wow. Great word. Very good. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Mark. Thank you. Yes, so, indeed. Don't you guys All want right. to add? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you have something else you wanted to add or do you want me to j jump into the next question? Oh, Here's the next question. Okay. Do, do you think the Bible is the final word or ethic on human sexuality, specifically homosexuality. And I think the question probably is, comes out of, what was it? Number four um, of your, yeah. what the Bible is not. The Bible is not a final word on Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that it is, it is the final word on sexuality? Yeah. By the way, why? we just chose the easiest two questions yeah. to yeah. ask you. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, as as you all know, I this one I would love to just pass on to um, Brian and Josh <laughs> because yeah, that's, right. that's that's why we made sure to get this one in there. Um, yeah, Dr. This, Mark, yeah. Thank you. This is certainly the hardest issue the church has faced in the last hundred years, and I would say probably in two thousand years, it's the most challenging issue because I don't think ever has the culture around us so rapidly and completely, pretty much, moved against the traditional position of the church. On, on this issue. Um, and um, that it's not going to get any easier. It's just going to get harder, I think, um, as, as culture moves against, um, you know, the position that, that the church has traditionally take, taken. I think the church has a lot to repent of through the years in terms of homophobia, for example, in terms of 
um, the way it, it's treated same-sex attracted people, the way it continues to treat same-sex attracted people, um, not recognizing the the temptations, not recognizing the um, the kind of conflict that many people who have those desires. Um, so I think that the church needs to be um, enormously compassionate in this issue, it needs to repent for its past behavior. Um, I do hold, continue to hold a traditional view in terms of that the God has designed, um, God's design for human sexuality is for, um, for monogamous um, heterosexual relationships. I think we need to develop a better theology of sexuality based on Genesis, the Genesis account. We need to build from there. We tend to jump right into the commands um, against same-sex relations without, first of all, understanding the nature of human sexuality. Uh, I think we need to celebrate celibacy um, for heterosexuals as well as homosexuals. We tend to say, okay, those with, with same-sex attraction, they need to be celibate, but then we don't impose that or we don't encourage that celibacy in terms of heterosexuals. And I think God's called both heterosexuals and same-sex attracted people uh, to, to celibacy in many cases. And um, we need to recognize uh, as well that um, our nature as human beings, um, that our humanity is more important than our biological sex. I think that's really important as well. Jesus says when he was questioned by the Sadducees um, on the this issue of, of marriage and, and divorce, and, and he, he basically said that, that in heaven there's no marriage or given in marriage, which raises an interesting question. Do we take our biological sex into eternity? Jesus seems to suggest not, uh, which, which means that maybe we're overemphasizing sexuality in terms of our identity as human beings. So I think that's a whole area that needs to be um, examined by the church. And um, um, I think it needs to be controlled by love and compassion. I mean, the, the way we respond to this issue needs to be controlled by love and compassion more than by condemnation. Um, and let me just throw out some name, uh, just a couple of names. There's a, there's a statement that came out called the Nashville Statement on Homosexuality. A very strident, very us against them. Um, I, I struggled with it when I read it. Um, and then there's another perspective by Preston Sprinkle. Some of you know his name and the Center for, um, I forget the, the, the Center for Christianity and Sexuality. It's got those two words and others in. That is a much more, it seems to me, more compassionate, um, more listening, um, more Christ focused ministry. So I would encourage churches to move in that direction um, to a position of welcoming but not affirming in the sense of not not um, not affirming same-sex sexual relations but welcoming people with those attractions and seeking to make them part of the family um, and allowing God's spirit to work in their lives as God's spirit is working in our lives. So I'm not wow. by any means answering the question completely, but um, I'll start with that. <laughs> well, yeah, we know we're. I think everybody here is sensing your heart and compassion um, behind that. And uh, since a lot of people, these were some of the big questions. Can I just ask a follow up to that? It's not here, but um, it has to do with the difference. OK, because um, on one uh, we're you know, there is a sense of of being able to to interpret that one way. But on another, you've said, you know, I think that we still need to, to hold to this. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about, about what the difference between the, the women issue yeah. and this, and this issue and, and how do we, how can we continue to, to make yeah. wise decisions in that? That's a great question, Josh. And I think for me, it's that third principle we just talked about. And I, I blew past it because we were running out of time, but canonical consistency is the thing, and by that I mean consistency in Scripture. Um, throughout Scripture, um, whenever same-sex relationships, and I don't mean inclination, I don't mean attraction, I mean actual physical acts of, of sex between same-sex people, is mentioned. It's it's viewed in a negative light. It's treated negatively. Now, again, there's cultural stuff going on. We have to acknowledge that. We have to study it. We have to put it through the same filter we put everything else through. But consistently, um, it, is, it is viewed as outside of God's will. 
Whereas, as I pointed out, the role of women is mixed. It's a very mixed bag in scripture. And so we see context in which women are assuming leadership roles. So I do think they are treated differently in scripture. And that doesn't make the same-sex attraction thing much easier because I think most of us know people who are same-sex attracted, who we love, who we care for deeply, um, who we maybe see the fruit of the Spirit in, maybe we see a real relationship with Christ in. So there's all kinds of cognitive dissonance still in that issue. But in terms of the biblical text, the consistency throughout um, is what, what keeps pushing me back um, to, to that position um, not just the consistency in scripture, the consistency throughout the church, the history of the church has also been. It's true that the, the church has abused same sex attracted people, but the, the fact that godly people who, with great compassion, still have recognized that this is not God's design for human sexuality for the last 2,000 years, that has been the dominant position of all wings of Christianity. Um, and so it's hard to believe the Holy Spirit. Um, guiding his church has not directed them to acceptance of this behavior if in fact God views it as acceptable behavior. Um, so church history argues for that position as well, it's, it seems to me. Thank you. Great, great answer. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. One, we have time for one more question, I believe. And really the next two questions that are highest on our list are, are very related. So um, here it is, uh, Mark. It's, if we have to perform exegesis to contextualize the Bible, can an unlearned person pick up the Bible and understand God? Is the Bible accessible to everyone? Mm. Great question. Amen. I think it's accessible to everyone. And it's accessible to everyone because um, we have great translations that accurately portray, the t or d accurately present the meaning of the text. Um, are so, you, are you, know, you referring... Are you referring to the ESV? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ryan knows my sentiments, yeah. Yeah, I serve on the NIV committee, so I, I'm biased. I admit that. But I would even say if you're a beginning Christian, then read the New Living Translation through, beginning to end. Read today's English version, the Good News Translation. There's some great translations that are even easier to read than the NIV. Then you can graduate to the greatest Bible ever translated, the NIV. That that You can do that. But, but no, I would say... You know, a New Living Translation there, I'll, I'll say, a, you know, a competitor, read through from beginning to end. You know, we one of our fundamental points was that the Bible is God's story. The best way to hear a story is not just to pick and choose, not to parse the verbs of it, not to diagram the sentences. You can do all of that. You can learn the Greek and you can still miss the story. So the best thing you can possibly do is read large chunks in, a, in an easy to read translation and get the heart of God. That's even more important than learning Greek, I would say. That's kind of blasphemous in my circles to say it like that. But, but I would say, since it is a story, learning the story is the best thing you can possibly do, which, which opens the Bible up for everyone. We can learn the heart of God by learning the story. So, so yeah, don't, don't feel like you have to be a biblical scholar or know the original languages or, or you know, write commentaries to hear God, God speak. He has communicated to us through his word clearly. Right on. I love right. that. Are there any on, any questions on here that you want to hear um, Dr. Mark answer that we haven't gotten to yet? Because it looks like we might Paul, have you do? time you had for one? one more. Oh. All right. All right. I, I'm just going to pick one then. All right. Um, Mark, were the Ten Commandments just for the Israelites? Mm -hmm. oh. like, should we put those up in courthouses or <laughs> is that just for them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always love to throw that one at my students because, you know, the Sabbath command is one of the Ten Commandments. And we know the Sabbath command, we're not under the Sabbath command per se, uh, because we don't worship on, uh, necessarily worship on the, on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, which is Saturday. Paul explicitly says this in Colossians, he says it in Romans chapter 14, he says it, he says one person worships on one day, one person worships on another, others treat days like. He seems to explicitly say that the, the um, Sabbath commandment has been fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews talks about that as well. It, it talks about the Sabbath being fulfilled in Christ. So though we are not under the Ten Commandments per se, they were given to Israel. Certainly nine of the ten are repeated in the New Testament um, all 10 reflect the character of God. And so we are to learn about the nature and character of God from the 10 commandments, just like we can learn about it from all, all of Israel's commandments. 
Now, there's no doubt that that was God's top 10 list for Israel. So they're pretty important. That's why we can kind of say these are fundamental for human behavior. Even though they were given to Israel, um, they apply to us because they were so important. They're, they're for the most part, moral, fundamental moral commands related to the nature of God and the nature of human beings. But um, but no, they're for Israel. They're commands for Israel. Um, but we obey the law of Christ, which is based like those Ten Commandments on the nature and purpose of God as revealed through the new covenant. Awesome. That's awesome. so great. All right, you guys, That's let's so say thank you to Dr. Mark. Yes. Mark, we, we really, really appreciate you. And what a, what a, yeah, even just the miracle that we can do this um, virtually. So um, we're so glad that uh, you could give us your time tonight. Um, we would all wish we could be here, hug you, greet you. But then again, brotherly kiss, brotherly kiss. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to demonstrate that up here. No, <laughs> no. Well, all right. Hey, right. Mark, let's uh, we're going to close in prayer. We'd love to pray for you. And uh, and then we'll dismiss our our crew here. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for the gift of your scriptures, um, your story, your words to us. And Lord, we want to be faithful stewards of, um, of the scriptures. And we want to learn them and understand them that we might know your heart and that we might be able to um, lead more and more people to you and walk as disciples in the life that you have for us. And so God, thank you for um, Dr. Strauss. We pray uh, for a quick recovery for him and um, continued fruitful ministry. We're so grateful for him. Would you continue to give him uh, favor and energy and insight? He's such a gift uh, to the Christian community at large, and we just pray blessing over him. Uh, thank you for tonight, for the chance to learn and to grow together. We are really thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. We hope to see you next month and even next week in community groups and in two weeks in prayer. We'll be right here. Bless you all. Have a great night. God bless, Mark. Thanks for bearing with me, everybody.